I can remember the first time that I actually saw a bird land on one of the flowers that I had planted to eat the seeds, and it was uh, kind of a pivotal moment for me to see a, a bird landing in my garden to eat seeds not at one of my feeders. So I wanted to share with you some of the plants that I've had the best luck with, as well as some of the plants that I've been uh, reading about that I think I'm going to start to include in my garden in the future. So the very first flower that I had a, a bird land on to eat uh, is called anise hyssop. There are a few different species of anise hyssop, but typically they are purple, sort of these long tubular purple flowers. Um, they have tiny flowers that kind of go up uh, a larger sort of floret. I don't know what you'd call it exactly, uh, but those different flowers open at different times. And so you end up with this really nice long blooming season uh, where you have nectar, pollen being provided for pollinators, and then later in the season, seed for birds. The stems of this plant are square and really sturdy. So what I typically see are goldfinches. I, last summer we were getting two pairs of goldfinches uh, pretty much every morning that would land and perch easily on the, on the stems in order to eat the seeds. These would look really great in a cut flower arrangement. Anise hyssop is also an edible flower and you can make a tea from the leaves. So it's a really cool uh, little plant, both edible for you and for the birds. Another one that I had read about and that actually showed up in my shade garden as a, as a weed is called evening primrose. This one I had read about and knew was sort of beloved by, again, goldfinches, other finches, sparrows. Another one that has a, a really sturdy stem makes a yellow flower that blooms a little bit later in the season, but also has a nice long nectaring season. So it's an important food source for pollinators, moths, butterflies, and it also produces seed for birds. It can be easily sort of found in disturbed areas. So it's thought of as a weedy plant. And I talked about it in another video where I was featuring it uh, as, as a plant to consider keeping if, you, if it shows up in your garden as a weed. Um, I was really glad I did. It was, it was really fun to watch that plant uh, bloom and see the different animals interact with it. And I did just last weekend see goldfinches all up and down in the branches. It's really hard. I'll show the video. It's really hard to see because I'm filming from inside my house there's a screen in the way and the goldfinches lose a lot of that bright plumage in the winter time so that they're not so vulnerable to being attacked when they're not in breeding season. But they were devouring the seeds in this even as late as uh, early January. Echinacea is generally a really awesome habitat plant. I planted a species that unfortunately is not native in my area. I didn't realize that when I first uh, started on my native planting journey. I planted a pale purple coneflower and there's another species that is native to my area that I'll be working into my garden. But this is another one that I think you can make tea from the leaves. Mine blooms fairly early in the season so it's one of my first flowers that I start to see a lot of pollinators flock to and they are all over it. And then the birds perch on top of the, the flowers and just sort of pick the seeds out of the little cone heads. They add a lot of winter interest to a garden because they will hold that kind of spiky dense structure throughout the season. A species that is native to my area in Maryland is Echinacea purpurea. And this one I believe is, in is considered endangered in Florida and um, considered extirpated in Michigan, which means that it's gone sort of locally extinct. So um, this is a, an amazing plant. It's a really great way to very quickly see birds start coming into your garden as well as pollinators. If you're starting to establish a habitat garden from scratch, this would be a really great species to include because you'll, you'll really quickly see results. So for all of these flowers, you're going to want to leave the spent flower heads into the fall and into the winter. So I know a lot of channels have started talking about sort of changing our thinking about fall cleanup from just sort of eliminating everything, getting it back to bare earth um, and leaving some of these things standing. And honestly, it's a lot more beautiful in the winter to have something to look at that's not just flat muddy ground. So um, I find it actually more attractive to have a habitat garden where we're leaving these plants standing and letting them collect snow or just seeing their structure throughout the throughout the winter and fall. If you're further to the west, then blanket flower is one that you can consider. This is, I think, either an annual or a very short-lived perennial, depending on where you live. This is one that can handle rocky slopes, sort of low moisture, soil, hot sun, so would be great for a potted garden, would be great for a xeriscape landscape where you're going for you know, low water needs. Um, so very awesome plant, great for pollinators and will attract lots of birds to eat the seeds if you leave the seed heads up. If you're in the east, then you could consider black-eyed Susan, which is again kind of a similar flower structure to the bank blanket flower and echinacea. Typically, I think what's sold in the nurseries, um, Rudbeckia herta, is a biennial plant. So its first year it would put on primarily uh, vegetative growth, so just basically growing leaves. And then its second year, it would bloom and go to seed. And this one, I think, can pretty readily self-seed. The Rudbeckia genus is one that supports, I think, something like 20 species of uh, butterfly and moth caterpillars. So this is an awesome plant even in the spring and summer when 
adult birds are nesting and, and having babies, I think something like 96% of native North American birds feed their young caterpillars. So any plants that we can get into our gardens that are going to produce seed in the fall and are going to be helpful as host plants for moths and caterpillars in the spring and summer are going to be able to feed birds sort of year round and help us to produce not only healthy adult birds, but also healthy baby birds and help these baby birds to survive. One that kind of surprised me that I have really loved watching is native grasses. I planted a fairly small patch of little blue stem. I think it's maybe seven plants in a small grouping and have absolutely loved watching both how animals interact with these grasses as well as just seeing them throughout the year. It's a patch of grass that I do not cut back at the end of the year. I wait until late spring to cut these back, sort of early summer. And so fall and winter, we have this beautiful patch of both the color is stunning, the structure is amazing. It surprises me sometimes that people think that a, a garden looks cleaner if you just cut everything back because I think it's, it's really stunning and it looks landscaped, it looks intentional when we have these structural plants that we leave up throughout the year. And in the fall, I started seeing birds creeping along our fence to nibble at the ends of the grass to get the seeds, as well as sitting on the ground underneath and hopping up to get seeds from some of the more drooping down stems of the grass. It was really sweet to watch. I really enjoyed seeing how much the birds loved those grasses. They're cool because they make, if you plant them, you know, with proper spacing, they make these little tunnels underneath and it's almost like a little forest for small mammals and for birds. You know, a lot of the time they would seek shelter in things like shrubs, but also these types of structural plants and grasses can serve as shelter for them as well, which is so important when you're having harsh conditions, cold conditions. I see a lot of nooks and crannies where I can tell somebody has been sort of cuddling up <laughs> when it snows. So uh, it's, a, it's an awesome plant. I can't speak enough. I think this one really deserves its own video. So I'm going to talk more about grasses in a separate video. But the one that I planted was Little Blue Stem. Prairie Drop Seed is another one that has a nice mounded habit. It's not an aggressive spreader and again provides kind of shelter and food for birds. Prairie Smoke is a plant I've never actually seen in person, but it's the cutest little plant. It gets about eight inches tall and it has little dark pink flowers that form. And then when they go to seed, they make these sort of wispy little fuzzy light pink to white uh, smoky looking little structures, sort of little tendrils that stick up out of the flower. And that's where it gets its name, Prairie Smoke. And this is another one that will attract birds as well. The birds will actually come in to eat those seeds. So a really tidy little plant, again, only eight inches tall. Prairie smoke will attract goldfinches in the early summertime. So some of these plants will go to seed more towards the fall and some in the summer. So, you know, it's, it's great to get a range of bloom times as well as, you know, that would sort of indicate that they would have a range of seed, seeding times as well in order to feed the birds throughout the summertime. Liatris is one that I'm planning to plant as soon as I can. I've been working on building up some gardens, but it, it's slow going. It's uh, hard to get all the gardens in that I want, but Liatris is an absolutely amazing plant to attract monarch butterflies, all kinds of butterflies and other pollinators. There's lots and lots of species. I went onto a website called Bonap, B-O-N-A-P, that provides regional maps that show you where different species of plants, different genus and species plants are native to. So helpful. I'll be putting these maps up throughout the video. Uh, but when I looked up Liatris, it was amazing. It was just maybe like 20 or 30 maps. So lots and lots of species of Liatris. I think it's probably native to almost every state, but uh, would have to go back and double check that. Among the different species, you can get a diversity in heights. I think you can get fairly short, like two, three foot stature plants, as well as up to something more like five feet tall. So a lot of diversity even just within that genus of plant. And this is another one that has nice sturdy stalks and goldfinches will hang on to the stalks and, and eat the seeds, which I would love to see because the yellow and purple, you know, the yellow of the goldfinch and the purple of the flower would be uh, quite beautiful together to see. So we have quite a few different North American native legume species, and one of these is called partridge pea. And this is one that stays a little bit more compact. Some of them are, are larger plants, like some of your senna's, and partridge pea is one that I think stays closer to two feet tall. I think this one prefers full sun to partial sun, gets yellow blooms with red centers, really beautiful plant. And this one will have seed pods that will form. That would give a lot of fall and winter structure to your garden as well, to have these sort of pods of seeds hanging from the plants. And this one will attract overwintering songbirds as well as game birds. If you're in an area where you expect to see larger birds like pheasants and things like that, you would be able to attract them with, with uh, partridge pea as well. All right, so hear me out on the next one. Native thistles are an incredibly important plant for pollinators, birds, just an incredibly important habitat plant in general. 
And there are a few non-native species that are highly invasive that I think have been here since the 1600s that unfortunately have caused people to kind of group thistles into this single category of noxious weed must eliminate. But our native thistles, uh, many of them are bi biennials, and many of them have deep tap roots and are not rhizomatous, so don't spread underground by rhizomes. And they're really not aggressive plants at all. And again, they're such important plants for habitat gardens. This is one that will attract, again, goldfinches. Goldfinches are just seed lovers, um, different sparrow uh, species, and even indigo buntings. I had an indigo bunting here maybe four years ago. It stopped at the bird feeder for maybe two days in a row. I got really terrible pictures of it, and then it flew on. Uh, but I was really interested in starting to look at what different species of plants could attract indigo buntings. They're this beautiful, vibrant blue color. And again, I've only ever seen one in person, and it was two days, two days that I got to lay eyes on it, and then it was it went on to some other region to get probably a better food source. Um, and so thistles would be one that you could attract uh, indigo buntings with. This is one that would add a lot of interesting structure to your garden. Many of our native species aren't prickly the way that the invasive species are, so many of them are actually very comfortable to touch. Um, and the ones that are thorny tend to not be, you know, nearly as, as sort of <laughs> uh, murderous as the invasive species. So there's so much <laughs> about these plants that I think would be misunderstood. So one to consider. Monarda is also called bee balm, is another amazing one for any habitat garden, any pollinator garden. This is one that will be highly attractive to pollinators in the summertime and then will go to seed in the autumn and birds will be sort of feasting on the seeds that it produces. And since these are in the mint family, they do tend to spread by rhizomes. So I think some people sort of give these a really dedicated space, either in a raised flower bed or just kind of let them have a little bit of sprawling space. But and another really amazing pollinator plant that will attract lots and lots of birds when it goes to seed. A plant that's kind of famously good at attracting pollinators is Joe Pieweed. This is another one that would be important to include in your garden if you want to support monarch butterflies. There's a few different species. Most of them are, most of the straight species get quite tall. I think something like five to six feet tall. And I believe there is at least one cultivar that stays a little bit smaller. Um, and so this is hopefully a plant that you could find for, for any size garden. But the seeds will persist well into the winter time, and so this is a really important one that will support birds sort of late into the winter season. Joe pie weed is one that prefers sort of moist to wet soils. In natural settings, you would find it along sort of river and pond edges, but uh, I've heard that it's not too fussy in a garden setting either. So I wouldn't let that deter you if you don't have a you know a bog <laughs> to plant this next to. I think you can still get away with with Joe pie weed in in a typical garden setting as long as it doesn't get too too dry. Two genuses that kind of surprised me in terms of, I, I had never really thought of them as producing seeds for bird, are goldenrods and asters. Goldenrod is, is a really important species, and I think there's something like 150 species of goldenrod. Um, so you can find it for sunny settings. You can find it that would survive well in a, in a sort of a woodland, shady setting. There's maybe, I think, zigzag goldenrod growing in a local uh, stretch of woods by me. I'll see if I can find some video of that, but uh, that one stays much shorter stature, something like like one foot tall. Many of the goldenrods are not terribly aggressive. Um, Canadian goldenrod can be extremely aggressive and, and spread by rhizomes, so you would have sort of a stand of goldenrod that was all actually just one plant, not even uh, different different plants of the same species. But many of our goldenrods are not aggressive in that same way. So, And there's such a diversity both in structures and site conditions that they prefer. Asters are another one. These are both keystone species, so these are really important to support all forms of life. Um, New England aster is one that I saw growing on a local highway, and I collected seeds from that and was able to start plants. I am late on an update on that little garden bed, so hopefully in the spring and fall I'll be able to show uh, those plants in my own garden now. I was able to collect seed and propagate them in my, in my own garden beautiful purple flowers. Both of these produce kind of fluffy little seeds. And so to my mind, they don't look like they would be very edible. A lot of the times, you know, we, we think of bird seed as being these big bulky seeds like, like uh, sunflower seeds. And a lot of birds also require the nutrition from these seeds that, that look much less like bird food, but indeed are sort of our native bird food. And speaking of sunflowers, there are so many species of sunflower. This is in the Helianthus genus. And there are so, so many different species of sunflower that are native, I think, all across North America that could support birds in your area. So typically what we would see producing these, these large sunflower seeds is 
Helianthus annus. So that's an annual flower, but we have lots of perennial sunflowers as well. One that was growing in my own garden as a weed is uh, called woodland sunflower. I need to transplant that to a little bit of a sunnier location because that really struggled to produce flowers. But this is, this is again, a keystone species. So really critical to you know, be hosting these keystone species plants in our habitat gardens. Really beautiful, something that will provide sort of late color in your garden. I recently did a video on berries and it was much easier to find information about the nutritional content of native shrub berries than it is to find nutritional content information for native seeds. So uh, I, I find that really interesting. I don't know if there's just not as much research in that area. Um, but the one seed I could get some nutritional information on was the Helianthus anus, this sort of typical looking sunflower seed. There's another genus of plant that's kind of similar to sunflowers, I think even sometimes called false sunflower, Heliopsis. So that's another one to consider. You could plant both Helianthus and Heliopsis, and both would be really important contributions to a habitat garden, and both would produce seed for birds. While seeds are a really important food source for birds, they aren't going to last them through the full winter into early spring. And so it's important that we're planting a diversity of foods in our garden. And one important one that will get them further into the season is berries. And so I have a separate video on different berries that you can plant to support birds through the winter and into the early spring. And you can watch that one here next. Thanks for watching and stay cozy.